welcome to Chiropractic Science, where you get to hear interviews with leading chiropractic researchers from around the world. Hear about chiropractic research from the authors in plain English, not through the media, nor a middleman. My name is Dr. Dean Smith, and I am the host of Chiropractic Science. I am a senior clinical faculty member in the Department of Kinesiology and Health at Miami University, and I'm also a chiropractor in Eaton, Ohio. My research interests relate to understanding how chiropractic affects motor control and human performance. Before we get to the interview with Dr. Pierre Cote, I wanted to thank all of you who have subscribed to Chiropractic Science, and I'm especially appreciative to all of you who have contributed five-star reviews on iTunes. iTunes reviews really help others find out about chiropractic science. So, if you like the show, please take a second and write a review. It will support chiropractors everywhere. I'd like to share a review on iTunes from a person with the nickname Dr. Richard DC, who says, Awesome podcast. Thanks for creating this great podcast. Very valuable information, delivered in a fun way. Great service to the profession. Well, thanks, Dr. Richard DC, for your review. I look forward to sharing your flattering iTunes review in a future podcast. Please consider making a contribution to chiropractic science to keep these podcasts going. You can do so on our website either by making a donation or by purchasing the evidence-based patient education slides presentation. We are also on social media, including Facebook and Instagram, so please connect with us there. All right, on to the podcast. Well, let's get on with the interview uh, with Dr. Pierre Cote. Pierre Cote, DC PhD, is an epidemiologist. In 2013, he was awarded the prestigious Canada Research Chair in Disability Prevention and Rehabilitation from the Canadian government. He is currently an Associate Professor in the Faculty of Health Sciences at the University of Ontario Institute of Technology, Director of the UOIT CMCC Centre for the uh, Study of Disability Prevention and Rehabilitation, and an Associate Professor in the Dalalana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto. Dr. Cote graduated from the CMCC uh, College in 1989. In 1996, he obtained a master's degree in surgery from the University of Saskatchewan. He completed his PhD in epidemiology at the University of Toronto in 2002. In 2003, he received a new investigator award from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. Dr. Cote was a member of the Scientific Secretariat of the 2000 to 2010 Bone and Joint Task Force on Neck Pain and its Associated Disorders, a large international collaboration aimed at synthesizing the scientific evidence on the problem of neck pain. In 2010, he reviewed and proposed modifications to the definitions of catastrophic impairment related to traffic collision for the Financial Services Commission of Ontario. More recently, in 2012, he was mandated by the Government of Ontario to develop evidence-based clinical practice guidelines for the management of traffic injuries. He submitted his report to the management of common traffic injuries to the Ontario government in 2015. Dr. Cote's research focuses on the understanding, the etiology, the prognosis, and evidence-based management of musculoskeletal pain and disability and mental health. Dr. Cote has published more than 200 scientific papers in prestigious peer-reviewed journals, such as the New England Journal of Medicine, the Annals of Internal Medicine, Pain, and the American Journal of Epidemiology. His 2017 Google Scholar H-Index is 56, and it's 48 according to Scopus. Dr. Cote, it's an honor to have you on the Chiropractic Science Podcast. Thank you for having me. Yeah, very good. Um, so excited to talk about uh, lots of different papers that you have, uh, some, uh, some recent ones and, and some, uh, excellent papers in the past as well. But first I'd like to get your, your, um, background a little bit. How did you become interested in becoming a chiropractor? Well, like many colleagues, I was first exposed to chiropractic when, uh, my mother who had some significant lower back and hip problem. I consulted a chiropractor for uh, for pain relief, and I used to 
attend the, the, the chiropractic clinic with her. And that's really how I got exposed to chiropractic and uh, got to see and appreciate the benefit that uh, it can give to uh, people with uh, musculoskeletal disorders. That's awesome. So <clears throat> you graduated from CMCC, and did you practice as a chiropractor for a while? Yeah, I, I graduated in 1989, and uh, right away I started uh, one of the residency program at CMCC, specifically the clinical sciences residency program. But from that time on until 1999, I uh, practiced uh, full-time for six years and then part-time for four years. And in 1999, when I uh, was very involved within my PhD studies, I decided to have an early retirement. But, but these 10 years of clinical practice were extremely uh, beneficial for me first as, as a clinician to see how uh, chiropractic can help patients, but also to understand uh, the multifaceted nature of uh, back pain, neck pain, and other musculoskeletal disorders. Absolutely. So what was it about uh, your practice career that made you want to go back to pursue a master's degree and then a PhD? Well, this actually started when I was a student at CMCC. And, and uh, like all chiropractors sitting in the classroom, you know, we were uh, instructed and, and, and uh, trained with regards to um, various uh, therapeutic modalities, diagnostic tests, various aspects of clinical practice. And, and very early uh, in chiropractic school, I, I started, you know, questioning not whether or not we should be taught these issues, but whether or not there were any research backing some of these uh, teachings that were given to us in the classroom. So my interest in research really started, I would say, from the second year of chiropractic training at CMCC. And that's really what led me to, uh, to do two years of extra tr uh, training after I graduated in, in uh, 1989. And during these two years of uh, clinical sciences residency, I first worked with uh, Dr. Silvano Mior at CMCC, and then I had the opportunity to go and work and practice with uh, Dr. David Cassidy at the University of Saskatchewan. And that's when I really got the research bug, so to speak after working with, uh, with Dr. Cassidy, and uh, he recruited me to, uh, to do a master's degree in the Department of Surgery where he, where he was uh, working at the time. Um, and the rest is, uh, is many more years of, of uh, research. Yeah, and, and lots of amazing papers, some of which we'll get a chance to talk about here in a minute. So you've, you've done very interesting and, and hugely impactful research over the years. So let's just go ahead and uh, start diving into some of these studies. And the first one is uh, a paper that came out in Spine in 2008. And this was a study, uh, probably uh, the still the biggest study to date, uh, to my knowledge, uh, looking at the risk of vertebrobasilar stroke and its relationship to chiropractic care. Can you tell us, uh, in your own words, uh, about that study? So this study was um, really uh, informed by the work that we did with uh, the Bone and Joint Decade Task Force on neck pain. Uh, and obviously, uh, when you make evidence-based recommendations about the effectiveness of a treatment, you must also... Uh, consider the side effects or the harms that may be associated uh, with a treatment. So historically, there has been a lot of uh, speculations about the risks associated with cervical spine manipulation and chiropractic manipulation to the neck in particular. So therefore, it became one of the main research priorities of the task force to uh, elucidate basically whether or not there is in fact a risk associated with, uh, with neck manipulation. Now, back in the early 2000s when we started our work, there was about 100 case studies, case reports that were published in the literature. And as we know, case reports or even small case series cannot be used to make any causal inferences about the relationship between a treatment and, and an outcome. Uh, but as we were doing our work, there were some case control studies. And the case control studies really an epidemiological design 
to try to understand whether or not there is a relationship between, in this case, neck manipulation and uh, and the development of uh, vertebral basal artery stroke. And, and it became obvious uh, quite early in our work that, uh, in fact, there was evidence that there was an association, but the question was whether or not this association was causal or not. Now, understanding causality, and I think we'll get into this a little bit later, is, is a very tricky business. Uh, but from uh, an epidemiologic perspective, you have to basically try to rule out any alternative hypotheses that, uh, that may account for what you observe. Uh, and in this case, in Canada, there was a study that had just been published in Stroke by Rothwell and I and, and Tal that suggested that if you see a chiropractor, your risk of, develop, of developing a vertebral basal artery stroke is increased by a factor of four to five. And that's significant. That suggests that um, there is a significant risk associated with the treatment. But at the same time, there was a good body of evidence, in fact, coming from, uh, from your country, from the Mayo Clinic, that suggested that most patients who um, develop a dissection of the vertebral artery first present to a healthcare providers or an emergency department complaining of neck pain or headaches. And obviously, it became very, um, it allowed us to hypothesize that one of the competing alternative hypotheses for what we had observed is that patients present to a chiropractor with neck pain and or headache while di their dissection is evolving, but before there is full signs and symptoms of a stroke. And that's really the combination of this body of work that led us to hypothesize that maybe what we were observing as an increased risk was in fact coincidental and was due to patients who were presenting to a chiropractor because they had a sore neck or a headache and uh, wanted to get some relief. And that's really how um, the, the, the theory and the design of the study uh, evolved. That's great. I really appreciate that background. It gives me a lot of insight as to what you were thinking, what your team was thinking in producing this study. So what, what was different about this study, your study in Spine 2008, dealing with the risk and the association of chiropractic care compared to the studies that had already been done? So we tried to improve it from two perspectives. One is that if we wanted to understand whether or not the association between chiropractic care and stroke was, um, was a, a real uh, association or a real increase in risk or not, we had to compare it to another group of individuals who were similar but had not seen a chiropractor. So what we hypothesize is that there would also be a group of patients with neck pain and or headache who were in the early stages of developing a cervical artery, vertebral or carotid artery uh, stroke. Uh, but instead of going to the chiropractor, they went to see their physicians. In fact, most of them would have done that. So the research hypothesis was that if the measure of association, the measure of risk that we, that we uh, computed for the chiropractic group was similar or lower than the risk that we measured for the physician group. That would suggest that our hypothesis of a stroke in evolution was in fact the likely reason for the observed results. So in other words, to, to, to simplify this is, that we try to understand whether or not there was an increased risk or an excess risk in seeing a chiropractor compared to seeing a physician. And as in Canada, for example, most of the, the medical doctors who would treat patients with neck pain would not manipulate or would not adjust the patient's uh, cervical spine. So therefore, by taking out that part of the equation that allowed us to determine or to understand whether or not it is the chiropractic care itself that was uh, related to what we were observing in terms of association. 
And it turned out that our hypothesis was, uh, was well justified. When we analyzed our data, we found that it doesn't, the risk associated with seeing a chiropractor or a medical doctor is basically the same, suggesting that there is no increased risk associated with chiropractic care. Wow. Yeah, that that's pretty amazing. Um now some of the some of the terms I just wanted to get an idea of what some of these terms mean uh from you as an epidemiologist. So, you know, I hear people using the terms uh slightly different. Uh so for instance, when uh, when it is said that uh there's risk or excess risk are they are they the same? In other words, is there is there a risk of chiropractic care uh, leading to these strokes, or is excess risk really the best term? And and what if any is the difference? Yeah. So when uh, in epidemiology, when we use the term risk, we really talk about incidence. So the two words in epidemiology are synonymous. So incidence is basically defined as the number of new cases that you observe in a group of people who do not have a certain disease. So the incidence of stroke, for example, in Canada in 2017 would be the number of people who develop a stroke amongst the entire population who was free of stroke at the beginning of the year. So that's what we talk, that's what we define as incidence and risk is synonymous of incidence. It basically gives you a measure of the occurrence of disease in the population. When we talk about excess risk, then we're really starting to uh, get in the area of, of causality. And what we are measuring is whether or not there is a difference in the incidence between two groups of people. Like in our study, between those who see a chiropractor and those who see a medical doctor. So excess risk gives us an idea of the relationship or the number of cases that are due to a specific exposure or treatments or any other characteristics that a patient may have. Got it. Yeah, thank you for clearing that up. That that makes it very, very plain. Um, one of the uh, things that we see in the popular media um, is, uh, you know, we, we hear about things like a pathologist, for example, might um, do an autopsy and determine that there was a vertebral artery tear and then perhaps come to the conclusion that a chiropractor either did or did not cause such an injury. From I've always had a hard time trying to deal with that from a scientific perspective, and maybe those two perspectives of clinical and and uh, or pathological, I guess, versus scientific, how how they may jive, or or do they jive? Are they are they just different concepts? Well, I, I think I think in in one case we're talking about identifying a lesion, which a pathologist, as you know, as we all know, are specialists that uh, that's their that's their specialty training. That's what they, they try to identify. They're very well trained, obviously, to look at, at uh, lesion and describe it. And, of course, they can, uh, I think, with a certain level of validity, uh, identify a, the dissection in the vertebral artery or a tear in the intima or other pathologies in the artery. Now, the issue is whether or not they can identify the cause of that tear. And uh, I do not believe that a pathologist, by looking at a slide or imaging, uh, can actually identify the cause. They can identify the lesion, but by identifying the cause, I do not believe that in most cases they can actually describe uh, why this lesion is present. And this is especially true uh, in the case of chiropractic manipulation. And, and often I think that in, in the media, as you mentioned, or even in court cases, uh, there's quite a bit of confusion between the concepts of temporality and causality. And in the main, in, in main media, we often uh, make conclusions that are based 
on temporality. Therefore, you will hear or read or watch on TV that um, people will claim that the chiropractor caused a stroke because prior to presenting to the chiropractor, the patient did not have a stroke. So therefore, if I see a patient with free from stroke and the chiropractor treats this patient and uh, hours later or a day later the patient develops a stroke, therefore it must be directly related uh, to the treatment itself. So temporality, although necessary to understand causality, is not, is not sufficient. And this is where our study, I think, really informed uh, the, the scientific and the legal discourse on this issue uh, b because we were able to demonstrate using a large population-based study that, in fact, there was no excess risk uh, associated with seeing a, a chiropractor compared to seeing a physician, and that even though these may occur in chiropractic offices, it doesn't mean that the chiropractic caused it because the dissection was likely present at the time of present at the time of presentation to the clinic and associated with symptoms that chiropractors would uh, frequently treat, such as neck pain and or headache. So the main the main confusion, I believe, is with the the words or the concepts of temporality. If A precedes B, therefore A cause B. That's, that's often done, uh, but that is not necessarily correct uh, when we talk about uh, causality of what causes a disease or an injury or a health problem. Mm, yeah, very good. Very, very good. Uh, again, I'm just, things are just becoming more clear in my mind hearing you talk about it uh, so plainly. That That's terrific. Well, if if we have um, you know these very large studies like the study that that you were a part of conducting, um, I, I am assuming that to try to get to some sort of causal design would require something like a randomized clinical trial, and that doesn't seem like that would be uh, a either feasible or be ethical to do something like that. Um, what are your thoughts? Uh, what do you see in terms of furthering the science from here? Does this kind of answer all the questions that you might have as a scientist looking into it? Or what, what do we have left to, to study with this? Yeah, so, you know, obviously the randomized controls trial is held as the gold standard uh, study designed to establish causality. But in this case, it's simply not feasible. I mean, we know that in, uh, in Saskatchewan and in Ontario, where we conducted our work, uh, the incidence of posterior art vertebral artery uh, stroke is about one per million. So it is just unfeasible to think about the number of individuals that would need to enroll in a study uh, to understand whether or not there is actually a risk. So, and this is when, this is where epidemiology comes into play because when we cannot conduct uh, designs like a randomized controlled trial, we can rely on other study designs which are more uh, liable to biases. And here I'm talking about the cohort study or the case control study. But if they are well conducted, they can nevertheless offer some, uh, some very uh, valid information about uh, about the relationship between a treatment and um, and a certain outcome, especially when we talk about adverse events or harms. Do I think that the randomized control trial will ever be conducted to inform this discussion? Uh, extremely unlikely. Uh, I think it's just, it would need to be too large and would, would cost uh, uh, too much uh, money. And therefore, what is important now is to see uh, analyses like uh, the one that uh, was led by Dr. Cassidy, our study replicated in other jurisdictions. And um, if a body of similar evidence grows, then it strengthens the argument about the validity of the findings. So I think that uh, the, 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 the key to this now will be to replicate 
the methodology or improve it in other jurisdictions with other data sets uh, and uh, see if we, the results are similar. Yeah, great. Well, given given some of the issues, some of the limitations of uh, of science in general, um, and as clinicians, you know, we look to the science to try to help us to figure out physical exam tests that we might be able to predict uh, vertebral artery dissections, for example, with or uh, factors in the patient history or exposures to physical agents or collagen disorders and the many other things that have been linked to vertebral artery dissections. What are some recommendations that you would have to practitioners in terms of either things in the history or physical screening or, or anything to try to, you know, do one's best to prevent one of these? So that that's a very very good question, and um, you know what I would really encourage our colleagues to do is not to rely on physical examination tests. Uh, for example, when when I studied in the uh, mid '80s, we we were taught the Hull's test and the George's test and the various variations of these tests, and the evidence is quite clear in. Uh, in, in suggesting that uh, these tests are not helpful. Uh, in fact, what they can do is uh, likely uh, give you some false positive results. In other words, they don't clarify the issue of whether or not someone is at risk of strokes. It, uh, it models it. It brings noise to the equation. So um, I, for, for the past 15, 10 to 15 years, We've really, really encouraged clinicians to abandon these tests because they are no value in improving their clinical judgment and improving their management of the patients. So in the absence of physical examination tests, uh, I believe that the best thing is to take a very good history and, as you mentioned, to ask about the risk factors for cervical artery dissection. And although there's a huge need of research in, the, in this area, as you mentioned, uh, risk factors such as connective tissue disorders, um, if someone who may have an increased aortic diameter, who suffers from atherosclerosis or diabetes mellitus, who has hypercholesterolemia, hypertension, who is a smoker, or even uh, someone who suffers from significant migraine headaches, uh, maybe at an increased risk of um, of developing a cervical artery dissection. Uh, we are still not able to predict who amongst the, the individuals who have these risk factors will develop it, but I think that they are helpful to inform the doctors uh, uh, about the possibility, although very remote, because as I said, it occurs about in about one per million in Canada and the United States, but nevertheless inform them about whether or not they are comfortable adjusting or manipulating uh, uh, the neck of a patient with, with neck pain and headache. So I would really, really encourage our colleagues to take a good history, to document the presence of these risk factors within the chart, uh, and then base their decision to manipulate, adjust, or use another treatment based on on these risk factors. And obviously, one of the strongest risk factors of a stroke is whether or not an individual has had a previous stroke. Uh, so I think it's really putting the puzzle together through uh, the history taking that can best inform our colleagues to make uh, good informed clinical judgment decisions. Very good. Very good. Well, I'd like to transition to the next paper, which has some similar themes to it as the uh, paper we just talked about. And that is chiropractic care and the risk for acute lumbar disc herniation. It seems like this is a topic I remember reading years ago, and if I'm not mistaken, um, uh, Dr. Cassidy had uh, written a paper about how much the uh, low back facet joints move and how much strain that might put on the uh, lumbar intervertebral discs. Um, but if you could guide us through this paper, um, the association between lumbar disc herniations and chiropractic, that would be terrific. 
So the, the, the methodology that we use for this study is, is similar in theory and in concept to the one we use to understand the relationship between chiropractic care and stroke. So in this, in this work, which was led by uh, one of our graduate students who's also a chiropractor, Dr. Cesar Encapier, who completed his PhD in epidemiology at the University of Toronto in 2015, we asked the question whether or not seeing a chiropractor uh, in, in patients who, with low back pain who see a chiropractor, whether or not they have an increased risk of developing a lumbar spine disc herniation. So again, using a type of epidemiologic designs where the participants act as their own uh, control, this is the self-controlled case series design, uh, we were able to, uh, again, compare a group of patients who saw a chiropractor with back pain and a group of patients who saw a physician. And in a very similar logic as that we use for the stroke study, uh, we were able to determine whether or not there was an increased risk or an excess risk associated with visiting a chiropractor. And again, uh, I think our study demonstrates that it is possible that it will occur in a chiropractic office, but that it is un very unlikely that the chiropractor tr who treated the patient caused the disc herniation. Why? Well, as we all know, and as we've all seen through our years of practice, uh, one of the early signs of a developing lumbar spine disc herniation is a very severe back pain associated with intalgia, stiffness, um, and, and that's before the sciatica develops. So these patients, as you know, will often come to us with severe, very severe low back pain. Now, if you treat them uh, prior to them developing their sciatica, it is possible that the disc herniation was evolving and then the chiropractor had very little to do with causing it. Now again to determine whether or not there was an increased risk, we did, replicated the same analysis in patients with back pain who phys visited the physician and uh, our analysis demonstrated that there was no evidence of excess risk for acute lumbar spine disc herniation in a patient who required surgery um, for their disc herniation, but had visited a chiropractor compared to a primary care physician. So it, it's very interesting to us. It was this body of work has been very interesting in clarifying some of the assumptions that we make about causality. And as you know, in Canada, in the U.S., several of these cases will lead to malpractice lawsuits and end up in the court cases. So it's been very helpful to us to inform or to clarify the assumptions that are made about causality related to uh, adverse events related to chiropractic care. Yeah, exactly. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, current clinical practice guidelines, uh, in particular with respect to imaging. You know, uh, most of us don't have x-ray vision or MRI vision, so we send our patients out if we suspect something like a disc herniation, and we get the images, uh, and okay, so let's say it shows a, a disc herniation. Um, you know, that that's uh, awfully expensive. I'm not sure it's necessarily going to change our treatment. What are some other ways that we might be able to screen for disc herniations, uh, perhaps physical examination, again, history, uh, are there some better than others? Yeah. So I think in the early phases of a disc herniation, and here I'm referring to a patient with acute uh, lumbar spine pain, lower back pain, uh, who has not developed sciatica. So these are this is the so-called prodromal phase of a lumbar spine disc herniation. And, and my advice uh, to, to chiropractic colleagues is that obviously the history um, and the physical examination, but the history in particular is going to give the best indication of uh, whether or not the disc might be involved. And, and although disc herniations can occur spontaneously, uh, they are... Uh, often uh, associated with trauma, blunt trauma, or uh, injuries such as lifting injuries, or even 
a repetitive microtrauma. For example, we know that there is an increased risk uh, in people who are uh, truck drivers or sit in cars for prolonged periods of time. Uh, so, a- again, uh, from my perspective, understanding whether or not someone may have a disc herniation goes back to taking a good history and looking at some of the risk factors for lumbar spine disc herniation. With regards to physical examination, um, as we know, these patients will tend to be intelligent in forward flexion. Uh, they will have uh, very severe pain, and uh, it will be very difficult to examine them. But in, the pra- in practice, obviously, in these patients, documenting the range of motion, including the abil- inability to move, uh, doing a good neurological examination to understand whether or not nerve roots have already been uh, involved, and uh, doing a nerve root tension test, such as the straight leg, leg raising test, are the bare minimum that all clinicians uh, should do. Now, our advice, or my advice, is that if we see a patient with extremely severe low back pain, and I'm not talking here about the average mechanical low back pain patients, but I'm talking about someone who is very intelligent, who has difficulty moving, has very severe pain, uh, maybe, maybe on the first uh, visit it, uh, it's not necessarily a good idea to try to manipulate them. Uh, so I think that giving them comfort to other uh, therapeutic modalities that, uh, that, uh, that, that we also can use in the clinic uh, can be beneficial and let time uh, inform the clinician in terms of ruling in or out the presence of, of uh, lumbar spine disc herniation because these patients tend to develop sciatica uh, in the days after the, the development of, uh, of their back pain. So I would say that being a little bit more conservative in these cases may be a wise choice um, and uh, will likely help the patient uh, get better faster. Yeah, I totally agree. And, you know, if, if you have that person that just can't hardly move at all, it's, it's, I mean, it's difficult to even have them lie on the table and, and get into any kind of position where you could even try to adjust them. That's my experience anyways. Uh, exactly. And as, as you know very well, uh, as their, the acuteness of their condition decreases, then uh, manipulation can be done because, I do not believe that spinal manipulation is contraindicated in a, in a patient with uh, lumbar spine disc herniation. What is very important, though, is that the clinician monitors them regularly uh, for neurological signs and symptoms and also be very attentive to the possible development of a cauda equina syndrome uh, because these, again, can, can uh, develop as the disc herniation evolves. Exactly. Let's move on to uh, the next paper, and that is Management of Neck Pain and Associated Disorders, a Clinical Practice Guideline from the Ontario Protocol for Traffic Injury Management, the Optima Collaboration. If you could guide us through uh, what that paper was all about, that would be terrific. So this was a study that uh, was mandated uh, by the Ontario government to inform the reform of the automobile insurance system in the province of Ontario. Um, and so I was tasked with developing a clinical practice guidelines for the treatment of neck pain related to traffic collisions, what most people call whiplash. So we updated the work of the Bone and Joint Decade Task Force on Neck Pain and Associated Disorders. That's the project that was led by Dr. Scott Haldeman and uh, basically uh, looked at the evidence for all conservative interventions that could be provided by healthcare providers in, uh, in the province of Ontario. So our guideline speaks obviously to chiropractors, but it also speaks to physical therapists, massage therapists, physicians, um, and everybody that, uh, that is reimbursed by our uh, automobile insurance system. So we reviewed the literature, and based on our our recommendations on evidence of effectiveness, that is that the treatment had to have documented benefits to the patient and safety. Obviously, it had to minimize the side, to be associated with minimal side effects. 
Um, and, and we uh, develop a series of, uh, of, uh, of recommendation. Now, I strongly believe that this clinical practice guideline uh, is important for chiropractors. Why? Uh, well, because in the acute phase of, uh, of a neck injury, of neck pain or whiplash, uh, the evidence is really suggesting that there are uh, two conservative interventions that are of benefits. One is manual therapy, manipulation or mobilization, and the other one is stretching exercises. And that's what we do. That's what chiropractors do. So as of 2015, the best scientific evidence suggested that patients with neck pain, acute neck pain, be treated with manual therapy, a short course of manual therapy, and stretching exercises. And we also recommended that patients must be educated about the, the nature of their conditions, and we assured that uh, most people with their conditions get better over time and that receiving evidence-based treatments will actually uh, help them to, to resume their functions and uh, such as returning to work. So it was very uh, interesting for us to realize that although there, there are dozens and dozens of interventions uh, that are often provided to patients with neck pain, those that have uh, significant scientific evidence are manipulation, mobilization, stretching exercises, and uh, reassurance and education from the clinician. And that's what chiropractors do. And I would encourage our colleagues to, uh, to use these recommendations when they treat these patients. Yeah, terrific. How soon after um, this type of injury would would it be reasonable to see the chiropractor? Is it uh, immediately after, or should we be thinking about the same thing as our low back pain patient we talked about? You know, if it's too acute, <laughs> you yeah, might want to wait I some think, time. I think in terms of consulting a healthcare provider, I mean, if the patient obviously feels in need of, of, uh, of getting some, some clinical help, then they should consult uh, at, at the earliest convenience. Now, the question is whether or not the treatment should be initiated right away. And, and I would use, as you said, actually, I would use the same analogy with the lumbar spine disc or the, or the acute low back pain patients, that it really be based on, on the results of, uh, of the physical examination, of the history, and tolerance of the patients. And, and, and this is something that we emphasize a lot through our guideline, that the treatment provided to patients must be patient-centered. Well, what do we mean by that? Is that we, we, we do not, uh, chiropractors and all clinicians should not behave in a paternalistic way and saying, well, this is what you will get and uh, we'll do, we'll start right away. But rather that they engage the patients in the development of the, of the plan of management uh, and discuss different options with them. So patient-centered care is really, as you know, focusing on establishing a relationship with the patient so that they, they become part of their plan of management. They understand the options uh, and, um, and that the doctor is aware and attentive to that. Now, with regards to one of the important findings, uh, I believe, of our guideline is that especially in the acute phase, the manipulation or the manual therapy or the treatment should be provided uh, not every day. Uh, we found, in fact, that uh, a maximum of six treatments over a period of, of eight weeks is what seems to provide the best results. And I think that this speaks to, one, the effectiveness of manual therapy, but also to the need to engage patients in their care, promote self-care, and monitor them over a period of time. And in fact, there is a body of evidence that suggests that patients with whip, acute whiplash injuries who receive uh, more than six uh, visits over a period of three to four weeks tend to have a worse prognosis. So I think we have to reconsider our, uh, how we are treating these patients, understand that more is not better than the right number of treatments, and that being too aggressive too early after the injury might have actually the opposite effect that we intend. It may actually promote disability instead of resolving it. 
So it's, it speaks to the importance of dosing the treatment in the appropriate manner. Sure. Yeah. Just from a personal experience, I can, I can say that I've certainly had patients after an automobile accident that have responded extremely quickly, maybe just even one, two, three adjustments. And then, you know, they they seem to be resolved from the injury, but I've also had people where six visits just wasn't quite enough um, and yeah. needed further care. Yeah. So I imagine and, and that's kind course, of an of average. Of course, you, you have as a clinician to, uh, to make an informed decision about this. I mean, if a patient is at 60 70% recovery and you feel that one or two other treatments may benefit them, um, I, I think that that's perfectly credible and legitimate. Uh, but what I think clinicians should avoid doing is to start them on a daily routine of, uh, of cervical adjustments for a period of three to four weeks. Uh, I think that, that this, is, uh, this is sending the wrong message to patients that, um, uh, that clinical care is the only solution to their problem. Uh, and I think that it minimizes the importance of engaging in self-care. So I think that an experienced clinicians know that that there is the right dosage of treatment to be given and advice and self-care. Uh, and that's really what I think the optimal, well, it's not what I think, it's what the scientific literature um, is uh, suggesting to be the right approach for the management of these patients. Very good. Well, let's talk about the, the last paper today uh, that we'll discuss, and this is uh, the annual incidence and course of neck pain in the general population, a population-based cohort study, and this was published in 2004. Um, if you could uh, discuss that paper and then maybe give any insight as to if these numbers have changed uh, over the years, and if so, how so? So uh, this paper uh, was done to try to understand, well, how many people in a given year actually develop uh, a new episode of neck pain. And what we found is that it's about 15% of the adult population, um, at least in, in the province of Saskatchewan where we did this work, will develop a new episode of neck pain. That is, they were free from neck pain at, uh, at the beginning of the year, and then they developed some episode of neck pain during the year. But more importantly, we were very interested in understanding what happens to them. How does, uh, how does the, this neck pain evolve? Because back then at the time, um, we were thought and the literature was suggesting that about 50% of people were getting better within three to four weeks and that about three to 7% of them develop chronic uh, problems. And that was really using in what is known in epidemiology as um, a survival type of analysis to understand prognosis, basically cancer. If you have cancer, what is the probability that you'll survive five years? So this methodology had been used to first get an understanding of the prognosis of neck pain. And our clinical experience had basically um, told us or raised the hypothesis that it wasn't that simple. Patients with neck, neck pain is, is an episodic condition. It comes and it goes. And uh, it's very important to describe for a clinic, from a clinical perspective what is the course. So we use data that we collected uh, from uh, a large cohort study in Saskatchewan and basically mapped the course of neck pain over a year. And what we, um, what we notice is that uh, out of 100 individuals, let's say, who have neck pain, about only 37% of them had complete resolution of their pain and disability um, a year later. So it's 37 patients out of 100 or individuals out of 100 who are completely cured for their neck pain. And more, more importantly, or equally importantly, about 33% reported to be better, but still had some pain or disability. Um, and, and, and about 37% had persistent problem. That is that the rate of chronic neck pain in the year was about 37%. So this was a 
big surprise because the early findings from the Quebec Task Force and other group had suggested that it was much lower. And I think it was a function of how uh, people had actually investigated prognosis. Uh, the other big finding is that we looked at people who had neck pain, got better, and how many of them had a recurrence, and we found that it was about 23%. So our study was really the first study to describe the rate of recurrence of neck pain in the general population. And this was, this was important for chiropractors because, I mean, we see patients coming to us um, once or twice or several times a year with a new episode. So it actually validated our clinical observation. What have we learned since then? Well, the research now has become more sophisticated. Uh, more uh, sophisticated and analytical techniques are now, um, they're called cluster analysis. So they're working on identifying groups of patients who have similar prognosis, of course, uh, of neck pain over a period of the year of a year, and what we're starting to do now is understand how it fluctuates more precisely over the course of the year. So our understanding now is that, as we suggested, um, it's only a minority of neck pain that completely resolves over a period of a year, and that most patients with neck pain will have an episodic. Uh, episodic symptoms, uh, but we're now able to map out more closely or more accurately how it changes over time. So I'm currently involved in a study with colleagues in Sweden where we can actually refine what we had previously found in our cohort study. And what's uh, very exciting about uh, the Swedish study is that uh, there was weekly uh, reports of pain and disability that were collected from a large cohort of patients with uh, subacute and chronic neck pain. So using uh, sophisticated statistical techniques, latent class analysis, we are now in a position to de describe very accurately how pain and disability uh, evolves on a weekly basis in people with neck pain. And I think that that's very, very important for uh, chiropractors and all clinicians who care for patients with neck pain because um, it will allow us to inform patients about uh, their prognosis uh, so that they are informed and that they can actually adjust their expectations with regard to um, not only the benefits from the treatment but also uh, the, the probability of recurrences or of developing or uh, persistent or chronic neck pain. So we are uh, making big strides in understanding how neck pain is evolving uh, now. Yeah, I think this is a huge, uh, huge understanding and something only really that the science can show us. And, and I just think it's extremely fascinating that, as you say, maybe even 15, 20 years ago, uh, the understanding at the time, you know, based upon, you know, the best studies that we had at that time so showed that people had, you know, or suggested that people seem to recover pretty well after a few weeks. And you know, so insurance yes. guidelines and all sorts of uh, guidelines were created based on these things, and it was just kind of a, a clinical, uh, I guess, rule, unwritten rule that seemed to, to be there, and now everything is kind of changing based upon the current science. It's amazing. Yeah, and if you think about what that meant, it meant, uh, it meant uh, either that uh, the clinicians did not uh, provide the right care, regardless of the discipline, uh, because the expectation was that patient could have should get better faster, or that the patient, in fact, might have been uh, 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 might have been contributing to the development of chronic pain. So I think now, by better understanding the course and the prognosis, uh, it's very important to. Uh, inform the expectations of the patients, of the clinicians, but also in our uh, payer system, inform the insurer uh, about uh, about what is likely to happen to these patients. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, with the last little bit that we have uh, left today uh, to discuss things, could you give us some kind of insight as to what are the important research issues you feel chiropractors need to address in the upcoming years? 
Oh, that's a big question. Um, I'll, I'll, I think I think a big area of research that we need to invest in is uh, understanding what the right dose response relationship is for our treatments. I gave you some hints with uh, with research that we evidence that we found in our clinical um, evidence based practice guidelines. Uh, but really, when when what is the right dose of treatment to achieve the maximum benefits? Uh, that's an area that we need to invest in, both in the area of back pain and low back pain, neck pain and low back pain. Uh, the other thing that we need to invest in is diagnosis. I mean, I remember studying in chiropractic school a battery of tests that I had to memorize because it was that long. And at the time, nobody was telling me about how useful or accurate these tests were. Basically, we were given these tests, and you had to do them. Uh, however, the diagnosis field has evolved tremendously in the past 10 to 15 years. And uh, I strongly believe that we should not do physical examination tests unless we have a clear indication that they are sensitive and specific and that they can actually give the clinician important information with regards to uh, the, the pathology or the source of the, of the patient's problem. And, and, and that's an area I think that chiropractic can invest and have a huge, huge impact globally uh, because uh, we are the ones who see uh, a lot of patients with musculoskeletal pain. Couldn't agree more. That was, that was very well said. Another area that I think we can make a big difference is in the area of the management of spine-related disability. And here I do not, I do not specifically speak about pain, but I, I'm talking about the impact of the pain on an individual's ability to function and to participate in their daily lives and in society. And, and here I would like to see research where the chiropractor gets a bit outside of his clinic, of the adjusting room, and goes and start functioning in a multidisciplinary team uh, that aims to rehabilitate patients with spinal disorders. So, of course, the adjustment and the manipulation can be one component of this. But, for example, if we speak about return to work, uh, we know that return to work is a lot more complex than uh, providing a patients with treatment, especially with the subacute and chronic ones, or uh, providing them with medication if you're a physician. The chiropractor, I think, because of the knowledge that we have in terms of, of, of the spine, we are very well positioned if we invest in this area in, um, in informing the multidisciplinary rehabilitation of, of disability. Um, and finally, another area that I think chiropractors can uh, really uh, make an impact in the research world is uh, elucidate the role of mental health on the prognosis of musculoskeletal pain. I mean, I'm sure you've seen uh, several of our patients that uh, either had a bit of depression or were anxious or lived with stress. And we know intuitively as clinicians that this may have an impact on their prognosis, but there's not a lot of research now that is actually able to describe that to clinicians and to patients. Um, and back pain, neck pain are endemic in society. Well, guess what? As you know, depression and anxiety are equally common, and they tend to go hand in hand. So understanding the synergy between mental health and musculoskeletal pain is an area that we should invest in because these are present in our patients. Mm, fantastic, fantastic points. The last question I want to ask you about is uh, part, of, part of the mission of Chiropractic Science Podcast is to try to encourage chiropractors and students to pursue research careers in chiropractic. Can you offer any advice to aspiring folks who might wish to take that path? Uh, absolutely. Uh, the first, first one is be curious. Uh, the second one is be critical, and by critical, I don't mean to criticize. I mean it's to to try to understand whether or not there is logic behind a statement or behind a treatment or whatever we do. 
Um, the, the third one is not to enter the research world to try to prove something. Uh, researchers don't prove anything. In fact, uh, never in science, nothing can ever be proven. So young chiropractors who go into research to prove anything with regards to chiropractic uh, or anything else might be disappointed. Um, we do research to find the answer to a question. So asking good question is uh, something that I would advise them to, to do. And finally, two things. One, select the right mentor. Uh, select someone who's passionate about research and is doing it for the right reason. Uh, and have fun. Research is fun. And uh, being able to have fun while you do research, I think, is the recipe to have a long research career. Excellent points. Well, I've really enjoyed our conversation today, learned a lot, it got me thinking about a lot of uh, things that I, I don't normally think about. So <laughs> and uh, so thanks for coming on. It was, it was a terrific conversation. Dr. Smith, thank you so much for uh, having me up to your podcast. Thank you. Thanks again for listening to this amazing podcast with Dr. Pierre Cote. For more great chiropractic research interviews, please continue to listen to Chiropractic Science. We are excited to bring them to you. Have a great day.